Welcome to Personal Landscapes. I'm your host, Brian Murdoch. You can find links for today's episode and other conversations on books about place at ryanmurdoch.com. Today I'm speaking with Carol Angier. She's the author of several critically acclaimed literary biographies, including Jean Rhys, Life and Work, and The Double Bond, A Life of Primo Levi. Her most recent work is a biography of the writer W.G. Zabald. He's a very difficult writer to pin down. You're just as likely to discover him in the fiction section, or travel, or history. He's been called a writer of almost unclassifiable originality. In his work, everything is connected, everything's webbed together by the unseen threads of history, or chance, or fate, or death. Readers of travel literature would most likely have encountered Zabald through the Rings of Saturn. Purportedly about a walk in or along the eastern coast of England, it's as much an interior journey as an exterior one. Indeed, the interior takes precedence, but it contains a remarkable array of digressions about natural history, about the herring, about Rembrandt's anatomy lesson, Joseph Conrad, the long-gone silk industry of Norwich, and much more. He writes about the nature of decline and fall, loss and decay, the downward plunge of nature and history. He draws on his own memories for these works, and he's also been accused of stealing the stories of others. We discuss all these things and more in today's podcast as we plunge deeply into the very strange world of W.G. Sebald. I hope you enjoy it. Carol Angier, welcome to Personal Landscapes. It's it's difficult to know... Um, where to begin a discussion about W.G. Zabel because he's such a complex character, but why don't we begin by describing um, the writing before we talk about the man? Cause this is how most people, most readers will probably encounter him. But the thing is they're likely to encounter him just about anywhere. The books are labeled fiction, travel, history, and they're all of those things and perhaps none of those things. So how would you describe his work? Exactly like that, all of those things and none of those things, you know. I mean, I suppose the largest single ingredient, which perhaps people don't always think, is is fiction. He's really a, a fiction writer. He was a fictionalizer, but he fictionalized, of course, real encounters and real people and made the one of those most striking things, I suppose, that everybody knows about, about his work is that uh, it reads as nonfiction. It reads as something very real. And how does he do that? Apart from the language, which is incredibly moving and powerful, uh, is, of course, the photographs that he puts into his work, particularly the two probably, well, I don't know whether they were the most famous, but certainly one of them, certainly Austerlitz at the end of his writing life, of course, is probably the most famous, partly just because he died soon after he published it in English. And that always has a kind of dramatic effect, doesn't it? But then the other, you know, emigrant, the emigrants towards the beginning, not the absolute first, but towards the beginning of his of his writing career, uh, those two great works, which are the works uh, really that deal with um well, I was going to say the Holocaust. They don't deal with the Holocaust. They deal, they're post-Holocaust um, books. They deal with refugees, survivors from the Holocaust and the effect that that's had on them, the disastrous effect of losing everything, especially their families. So, you know, his writing is extraordinary because, first of all, it's largely, although not entirely, of course, uh, about that subject. That's perhaps the most thing he's best known for is writing as a German about Jewish refugees. And that is extremely striking and rare, or relatively rare. And um, to me, was extraordinarily moving. There's a problem about it today. People seem to think there's a problem about it, uh, that it could be called, is called by some people, cultural appropriation. And he gets into trouble about it. That's something I just, that's funny. I just wrote a blog about this, cultural appropriation. Uh, my background is anthropology, so it's it drives me nuts, this term, because this is how cultures work. You know, we we exchange ideas over immense periods of time, take the good ideas that somebody else has, has shown you and maybe assimilate it into our own tel- cultural tour kit for, toolkit for navigating the world. And I mean, this is how cultures evolve and thrive and how humanity has evolved. So this this concept is just bizarre to me. 
you feel that from the point of view of, of, of someone as an anthropologist. I feel it as someone as, as someone involved in literature and art and writing. I mean, if we can't write about anything but ourselves, in the end, narrower and narrower and narrower, never even our group, but just ourselves and write autofiction. I mean, we, we lose the whole point of literature, which is an expanding imagination, as you say, including other cultures. So, uh, and I mean, I always feel that they should, people who take this line should ask us, should ask me, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm the daughter of Jewish refugees. Um, I picked up this book and what moved me most of all was the way that someone in his position was writing about uh, someone in my position, as it were, or my parents' position. And that to me was, was incredibly moving and I couldn't understand why anybody would ever object to it and I still don't. Um, but, I mean, just to finish a little bit about his writing, because I haven't said really the most important things, which is how unique his writing is. How I mean, that's what Susan Sontag said, didn't she? She said his books are like no other book she'd ever read. And that's certainly what I felt when I first picked him up and then throughout. I mean, nobody writes like Zabar. People try, but then it's pastiche, you know. Uh, or people are said to write in a Zebaldian fashion. Everybody writes in a Zebaldian way these days, according to critics, but nobody does. And if they do, it's a disaster. He writes in the most mysteriously evocative way. There's always a sense behind the words that he uses of something else he's writing, telling us. And we, we know what one of those things is because he never mentions the word Jew or Holocaust or concentration camp, but, we know that's what's behind it all the time. We feel its presence. And throughout all his work, we feel the presence of other, another world, other times, other places, uh, all of which, you know, are starting in a way he gets them to meld together. Uh, time is very strange in, in Zebad. And so is language. His language is extraordinary. Well, he writes in a sort of an archaic German uh, vocabulary, wasn't it? I've never read it in the original, obviously. Yes. Why? He wrote in an archaic German because, like many, or perhaps all, post-war German writers, he wanted to avoid the contamination of the Nazi site and what that had done to mm. the German language. And what a lot of the, or what other German post-war writers decided to do was to write in a very modern and a very, you know, new way. And what he decided was to go way back to before and to the part of German literature that was his passion, which was the 19th century, or part of his passion. And therefore, he went you know, back to uh, some of his oldest models, like Stifter and other um, 19th century writers. And um, that's why he did it. Also, apparently, and I only learned this afterwards, he, there, there are provincial ch touches in his German. Uh, Bavarian touches and even Algoirish touches, you see, that to do with the Alemannic German that he grew up, uh, or was his first language. So um, it's an unusual uh, German, uh, old fashioned. And I think this is partly one of the differences why between the way that he's received in Germany and the way he's received in the Anglo Saxon world. Because on first blush, anyway, German readers just feel, well, I think they do. You tell me. But I think they feel, the ones I've certainly spoken to, um, all feel, well, this is very old fashioned. Nobody's written like this for, you know, decades and decades, uh, maybe 100 years. And, um, you know, why, why, why this is just old fashioned stuff. And they sort of don't you know, pursue it any further. Whereas in English, there's nothing like that. The English that he writes, because he did write it, essentially, you know, he got his translator's version, which were in both in the cases of both his translators, pretty terrific, but he wasn't happy with them. And he, particularly with his first translator, which we might talk about, he rewrote his English versions extensively so that in the end, the English versions of uh, Zebal's works are really written by him. So that is an extraordinary uh, fact for English readers. That's to say we're reading an original in a sense. That's really interesting too, right? So much of his work draws on layers of, of other people's stories melded with his own stories and memory. And, and, and even the English translation draws on somebody else's translation of his original German melded with his own English. So it's such a, That's right. yeah, such a fascinating mix. 
the thing that I think is most Zebaldian is also basically people's descriptions of his work. Uh, they, 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 end, they end up veering into his language because it's so hard to pin down. Like he's been called um, a writer of uh, almost unclassifiable originality. That's the, the best description I've seen. His, his friend, um, Michael Hamburger, described his writing as essayistic semi-fiction, <laughs> yeah. which gives uh, kind of scope to both um, observation and imagination. Yeah. What, what did he mean by that? Well, I think he was dead right, don't you? Uh, I mean, there's so many, Zebald, you know, typically wrote, uh, as it were, he threaded things together. He always talked about it, certainly in you know to his friends and family, as um, like the rag rugs, you know, the fleckel tepish uh, of of his childhood, where you know bits of, uh, of material will be woven together to make these rugs, and that's what he does in his work. That he weaves together things, and many of the things he weaves together have this essayistic flavor, don't they? So you know, and Austerlitz, all the stuff about. Uh, architecture, the railway, Antwerp railway station and the Palaisistis and, uh, you know, all, all sorts of architectural lore. And also that opening bit about um, all the fortresses. It goes on and on about fortresses for about, you know, I don't know, 10 pages or something. And it seems like a digression, but of course it isn't a digression really. Actually, it's functioning as imagery. Because what are the fortresses? They are defensive, protective things which don't work, never have worked. They're absurd failures. And they trap the defenders in a vulnerable position where the attackers can constantly come from every side. And so, and this is an image of what um, uh, Austerlitz is doing with his attempt to forget, not remember, seal himself off from from attack from the past and it's not working it just makes him more and more vulnerable until he breaks down so there the essayistic bits are always in there there's bits in rings of saturn of course about herring fishing uh you know <laughs> there's always always all sorts of almost arcane um, um information and so that's the essayistic part I suppose, and and the fiction, of course, is what he's doing with with his characters, mm. where, where he is telling us uh, largely fictionalized stories, but uh, actually also very very close to the the original stories. And he always said that his stories were authentic. That was the word he used. They were authentic, and the photographs were authentic, and and they were, I mean, largely were. I mean, for example, the, the story of Paul Beraita in The Emigrants, uh, every single photograph in there is taken from the family album of the model for the story, who was his primary school teacher, Armin Müller. And so in each case, or almost each case, not entirely, because some of the photographs are entirely fake. Yeah, this is something I wanted to ask you about as well, the photographs and the role that they play. I, I read somewhere that he also kind of artificially aged the photos. Like uh, there was, a, I don't know where I heard this, maybe on the backlisted podcast, they were talking about the rings of Saturn and they, he, they talked about how he would, um, the printer or somebody was complaining about the photo quality. And they said, no, he, he photocopied it multiple <laughs> times to make it look vaguer and older. That's right. And not, not just older, but vaguer, vaguer, more mysterious. You know, the uh, way that I got the story was I think from the horse's mouth, and that is that was is uh, the uh, photographer at the University of East Anglia, Anglia, who was employed by the university, you know, to provide slides and photographs for the various lectures and so on. And he did many, many uh, of those slides for uh, Max's for Zebald's lectures. Um, and then Zebald asked him to do photographs for his books. You see, so what would happen is Zebald would get the photographs, either snaps that he'd done himself most of the time, or photographs, as I say, from people's albums or wherever, from books sometimes. And then he would give them to Michael, Michael Brandon Jones, who's the photographer. And Michael would re-photograph them. And Michael, of course, is a photographer. So he would want to make them beautiful, sharp, you see. And then he would show them to Max. And Max would say, no, 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 Michael, Michael, no, I don't want it sharp like that. Make it vague. Make it more like the snap I took. And he would Poor Michael would have to go back to the drawing board and make them, you know, worse, actually. And uh, that's what that's what Sebald wanted. He because it he wanted the elusiveness and elusiveness of his own prose. These are not to be, you know, sharp illustrations. These are to be evocative, 
bits of, you know, different aspects of the art. What do you think they added to the books as books? Certainly in the case of the two great books about the Jewish refugees, the emigrants and um, Austerlitz, in particular the emigrants, which is in this way the most Sebaldian book we have, actually, um, they added, first of all, an enormous impact of reality and directness, you know, so that you were reading this, these stories. Perhaps you had no view to start with whether you were reading fiction or nonfiction or you were just reading. And these photographs would make you feel absolutely, you know, you could look into the eyes of these people and they were absolutely real. And this was an effect that Zebald wanted to create um, because he was telling stories that he felt people needed to know. And that people in Germany in particular didn't really know well enough because however people knew the past and worried about the past uh, and felt all sorts of guilt or not about the past, they didn't really know any or many Jewish people because after the war there weren't many for rather obvious reasons. So Zebal himself grew up without meeting any Jewish person. There were one or two in the, in, the, in the town where he went to school, but he never met them. They were old people. So he never really met a Jewish person. It wasn't until he came to England at 22, and he happened to come to Manchester, which is a large Jewish population, and also a large refugee Jewish population. And as it turned out, his own uh, landlord, who was called Peter Jordan, who was a wonderful man, um, was a Jewish refugee from Munich. So right near, obviously, where Zebal had grown up. So it was, this was an encounter for him, a revelation. He knew, of course, he'd been worrying about it since he was 16, tormenting himself since he was 16. But to actually meet a live person, that was the, the revelation of the reality of this truth. Peter Jordan had lost his parents in the Holocaust and so on. So he wanted to, I think, recreate that encounter feeling in, in his books, in those two books in particular. And he did that partly through the photographs. But then, of course, you know, you do then get a complicated tension, which he was quite deliberately creating, really, because as you read on, you realize you're reading fiction. These are fictionalized stories because they're too perfect. They're too of a piece. They're too artistically uh, you know, consistent and beautiful and overpower, you know, the motifs that run through them. It's clear he's writing fiction, you're reading fiction. And so then you think, well, who are the photographs of then? You know, these are fictional characters, so who are they of? And, and you then suddenly start to worry or doubt about the photographs, you know, or be exercised about them. And he wanted you to do that. As a writer, he was interested in destabilizing, uh, you know, the reader's experience as well and didn't want you to be just, you know, gulping down these things in, in, in a simple-minded way. So even in one of the stories in Max Ferber, he introduces a photograph. You'll probably remember it. It's a photograph of a book burning in Wolfsburg. And there was a book burning in Wolfsburg, but this is a fake photograph, and it's obviously faked. And there's like three, two pages about how this photograph was a fake. So he's alerting us, and he said in an interview that he did it quite deliberately. He's alerting the reader to the fact that the stories are true, but he's conveying them to us through a trick. And so this is, this is you know, at the heart of what he does. And it is extremely powerful and moving as a first experience. And then it's also destabilizing and worrying. And that's very Zebaldi. Well, it's interesting too. I was just thinking as you were saying this about how, how important the role memory plays in, in all of his work. But in, in the same sense that at some point you realize you're reading fiction, isn't this the way we create our own memories as well? Like your memories of an event, of an event or a past uh, or your own past even are not as cut and dried as you think they are. Different things you encounter in life, different coincidences cause you to reinterpret the things that, that you saw in one way in the past. You start to see them differently. And this happened to him as well. So not only do you start questioning the authenticity of the story that he's telling, but you, you kind of start looking at your own memory and your own story of yourself differently, I think. Yes, I think that's exactly right. So that although his work 
is all about memory and the importance of memory and keeping in touch with it and making it live in the present. But nonetheless, at the same time, it's largely about the elusiveness of memory, the unreliability of memory. I mean, starting off in, in, in vertigo, for example, you know, uh, there's a whole thing about um, uh, Sondal, uh, Bay's memory of, uh, of a scene that he sees of a battle, you know, when he's uh, coming down into a valley. And uh, it turns out that this is exactly, this is a, a, an etching that he sees, that he's remembering, he realizes. And it wasn't his own memory at all. So straight away, there's this, yeah, alerting us to the difficulties of precisely the important vehicles that Sebald is employing to move us and inform us about these stories. Yeah, it's, it's, it works on so many layers too, because he's also talking about national memories and you know the national memories of the of the place he came from and how that continuously becomes excavated and uh, yeah, his own childhood. That's another interesting topic. I mean. In reading your biography, I've constantly think about the Aristotle quote, you know, give me a child until he is seven and I will show you the man. Uh, how did how did Zabel's childhood shape uh, where he ended up or kind of his interests and his obsessions? Well, I think from what I learned of his childhood, he was, uh, perhaps most people are, but he was extraordinarily himself early on, you know. So, uh, for example, when he, the key thing was, of course, that his father was a soldier in the German army, uh, who fought throughout the war from the very first, from the invasion of Poland right to the last days. And indeed, so he was on both fronts, the Eastern Front and the Western Front. He then was spent two years in a prisoner of war camp in, in France. So he didn't return home until 1947, when Zebald was three. So he spent the first three years of his life um, with, with without his father. And when his father came home, it was... Uh, as it was for many, I think, Germans of that generation, a difficult, uh, a shocking relationship. You know, he had, he he loved his grandfather. That is a very, um, I think everybody knows that about Zebald. He loved his grandfather. He was in this little happy family for him, his grandparents, his mother and his sister and himself. And here came this man and he said, who claimed to be my father. And from the first moment, he set his face against him. But not only did he do that, he did that in a particular way. One of the first things he noticed was his father didn't speak the same language they did. So he was absolutely attuned to language. At three years old, he felt, wait, you know, this man apparently knows my, my, my mother and my sister, but I've never met him. And he doesn't even speak our language, you know, uh, because uh, at home at that time, uh, Rosa, his mother, spoke. they spoke Algoirish at home. Then when the father came home, they didn't any longer because he didn't come from the Algoi. He came from Lower Bavaria. So they spoke German at home. Uh, however, you know, they, so that was one of the things. And then later, you know, when he was about seven or eight and he had this experience of meeting his American family because his mother's brothers and sisters all emigrated to the States and they came home in 1951 on a on a you know visit back to Vertach im Allgäu, where they had left from, of course, and um, one of them who came along was his great uncle, uh, his great uncle William, and this is the model. It would turn out to be then the model for his story, uh, Amos Adelwald. And what did the boy notice straight away was uh, um, um, great uncle William's language, his language how he spoke. He spoke in these beautiful, perfect, you know, not a not perfect German, no, not a word of dialect, uh, not, a, and, and he was in a different world linguistically from Zebal's surroundings. And that struck him when he was seven. So is that seven? Yeah, seven. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think he, he, from very early on, he was, uh, first of all, not, um, he didn't find relationship easy, easy from the beginning. If you look at photographs, and I put them in my biography, of him as a child, he's always looking lowering and glowering like this because, of course, it's a photograph. So somebody's photographing him by definition, and this is an intrusion to him. You can see it. He almost never has a smile on his face, even at six, you know. And we all know that Zebal is famous for his, his gloom and doom uh, as a writer. And indeed, as a person, he was even gloomier, probably, than he did in his work. 
Um, but as at least later on, I mean, I met him when he was in his uh, late 50s or mid 50s, I guess. Um, and he was extremely gloomy and made a great joke of it. It was very entertaining. You know, he would say the most mm. dismal, gloomy things with a kind of um, ironic glint in his eye, you know, and you had to laugh. <laughs> so uh, he was very good at telling terrible stories. His famous stories were um, always about um, the British railway system, <laughs> which was then and still is pretty terrible. And uh, he would say things like, you know, you'd get in a train and then like after 10 minutes, it would stop and it wouldn't work anymore. So then you'd be switched to another train and 10 minutes later, that one would stop. And then you put in another and that would go back to the beginning, the first place. And he said, and that is the British and that is British rail, he would say in his deep voice. And people would just find him extremely funny. But, you know, what? what and they just thought he was putting on a, you know, a, a gloomy show. But actually what he was doing was rather what he does in his books, which is a double bluff, really because he was playing the gloom bucket, making people laugh at it. But actually, he was a gloom bucket, everything he was saying. You described it as his essential solitude. I think I read this somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. That struck me so strongly that, that from the very beginning, uh, you know, he did have very good, warm friendships in his early life. And he had a very close relationship with his elder sister, with both his sisters, but particularly the elder one, because she was close in age to him. Gertrude is only three years older, whereas his younger sister, Beata, is seven years younger. Um, so he had a very close relationship to his sister throughout his life and also to his first earliest friends, uh, his German friends. Um, but beyond the those friends he had was always people experienced him as someone who was away you know in a, a, behind a gap somehow there was a gap between him and others and i think he he did have yeah a a problem about uh relationship and a problem about experience actually i came to think i came to think in the end that he experience was so invasive for him and every experience, because he actually said this, he said it in an interview, uh, not to me, not interviews that I did with him, but with others. He said, um, I have difficulty distinguishing between a memory and a present experience. I experience them both equally. And this isn't normal. It means I can't live a normal life. And I think there was something true about that, that all experiences, you know, actual perceptions, memories, and imaginations things he imagined, were all equally powerful to him. And um, if they were negative or worrying in any way, would be destructive. He couldn't cope with them. So he tried to seal himself off from, uh, you know, too invasive experience, which meant that he then ended up, you know, rather like Austerlitz, you see, exactly, because Austerlitz in that way is a self-portrait. All of his characters are in some way self-portraits, as they almost always are for artists. You know, everybody, I think, knows that. You know, I think even Vasari in the 15th century said every painter paints himself. So he, was, he had this essential solitude that he was cut off in some way as a self-protective mechanism, which then turned on itself and was not protective anymore, but destructive. And that's what he is exploring in, in Austerlitz, amongst other things, of course. So was writing a way to, to deal with this for him, to take some control over these memories and experiences that were impacting on him and kind of put him down into a controlled space, a white space on a page, in a sense? I think that's right. I think that there's an element of rightness about that. Uh, I think, um, you know, about the, about his starting to write, because, of course, he, he began his own literary writing, at least his own literary publishing, because he always wrote poetry throughout his life. He only began to write and publish in his 40s, in his early mid 40s. So, with After Nature, which was, you know, Nacht der Natur, which was uh, when he was in his early 40s. And then his prose, you know, with Vertigo, he started with Vertigo. So, um, and, and late, 44 was he, or something of that kind. Uh, and he always said, you know, when interviewed, he became rapidly very famous, of course, only in the last five years of his life. And interviewers all asked him, you know, well, why, 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 why did you start writing? You know, late in your life, and um, 
so relatively late. And Zewald would always say, well, I never intended to, to be a writer. I never had, never planned that. Uh, I started my own creative writing, my own literary writing, to escape my academic routine, which was becoming, you know, uh, oppressive. And this was false. This was one of his many fictions that he told about himself, self-protective fictions, because not only had he always written throughout his life, you know, even like in his school magazine and in his university magazine, he was writing. Uh, at his first university, he joined, he, he was part of a little group of three friends who called themselves Gruppe 64, you know, to sort of echo Gruppe 47. And um, they were going to be, all three of them were determined to become the great German novelist, to write the great German novel. I mean, he was 19 and 20, and that was his decision, you see. So the story that he never intended to be a writer was not true. But I think what happened was that he got into his academic career, and then obviously that was very involving, and he had to work very hard. And so for many years, he, he didn't do much else. And then what precipitated him into his literary writing, his prose writing, which turned out to be his, his right home, <laughs> um, was a crisis, I think. It was a... Certainly, it coincided with a crisis in his life. He had several emotional, mental crises in his life because, as I've already described, he was a vulnerable person. He found it difficult to remain on an even keel emotionally and mentally. And he had a first breakdown, really, as far as I can establish, at just about 18, just before his 18th birthday. Then he had another when he was in his first term uh, at Manchester when he was 22, and he explores that in uh, Max Ferber. The narrator undergoes a, a similar uh, breakdown. Uh, and then I think when he was around about 35, and he says this in several interviews, he says, I thought I had control of my life until I was 35, and then it was over. I have not been in control ever since. And he doesn't say what he means by that, but I think he did have a quite a severe emotional mental crisis at around about that time, which he explores actually in Vertigo. So the whole, you know, what happens to the narrator as he does his journey across Northern Italy to um, his home village of W. <laughs> uh, and he, you know, he has hallucinations and he, he had all kinds of strange mental aberrations. And then he actually has a kind of paranoid sense that he's being pursued Right by these two young men, who clearly um, have uh, well, he's he's terrified of them, terrified, and and he clearly uh, fears attack or murder or whatever, and he ultimately identifies them as the two young murderers, Abel and Furlan, who back in the early 1980s, which is the time when the book is set, were indeed murdering. They ended up. I think they had a tally of about 37 or something dreadful uh, murder people who they'd murdered before they were caught. So this, I think he had this, I do think he had a serious, all his life he fought to remain stable, but he had some very serious periods uh, of mental disturbance. And that was one. And I think he wrote particularly Vertigo, but then the rest of his books, as you say, to explore and contain and make use of, you know, make art out of these um, breakdowns. In Vertigo too, didn't he lose his passport? Yeah. At one point in the book, so right? You yeah. could really see his, his passport itself. You know, his identity is lost, and yes, and he has he, to go through a process of recovering it. That's really interesting. That's right, and he puts a photograph in, doesn't he? Of yeah. his passport photograph with cancelled, that great big black line across it. You know, which is quite terrifying, and in fact. The photograph, uh, passport photograph, which is in his um, archive in Marbach, you know, in the Max Ferber papers, doesn't have that cancellation. So that was something he introduced. Either he got Michael Brandon Jones to, or perhaps he must, I don't know how he did that. But there we are. He cancelled himself. Very interesting, huh? You could see that this, how this could be um, dealing with some sort of a break in self mm. or, uh, yeah a break in his own identity and kind of a reconstruction of it or, a, a, you know, unearthing, yeah. Exactly. Unearthing something new. I found yeah. it interesting too, that even in his academic writing, he brought some of these same sort of um, 
flexibility with the truth to bear. Like he was, he invented footnotes and didn't he invent an entire letter yeah. as well? Oh, honestly, he was such a, he was such a bad boy. He was such a trickster really. Uh, I mean, because if you introduce fictions into your fiction, that's okay, you know, but to introduce fictions into a academic, into a, uh, a dissertation, uh, MA or PhD dissertation. I mean, this is, you know, crossing a line. I feel, I mean, I am kind of ex-academic and uh, I, it was really, I was quite shocked by that. Uh, what he did was um, he, he, it's in his um, MA actually, it started off uh, as a licence that he did in his undergraduate course at the University of Fribourg, but he developed it into an MA thesis at Manchester. And in that one, he refers to uh, two letters that um, Adorno wrote to him. And, you know, so my first thought was, wow, did he make that up? He didn't make that up. No, he wrote to Adorno uh, asking his, you know, advice about uh, the work, about a particular point. And um, Adorno did reply, wrote him a letter. And so he had this one letter. So the first quotation is from that letter. And he says it's from this letter and gives the date. And then he quotes again. And he says, this is from the second letter. He gives a different date, you see. Uh, and he, well, it turns out, as I discovered, that um, there was only one letter. He didn't get one letter. And the second quote came from that same first letter, not from another one. So the trick was really not, not too um, shocking and dreadful, because indeed Adorno did write that to him, and he quoted it accurately. However, he made up the fact that this was a second letter. And first of all, I was shocked by it because I thought, well, it's a bit sort of showing off. You know, I had two letters from Theodore Adorno. You know, there he is, a young, unknown, you know, MA student. But then I realized that the date that he had put, that the second letter had come, was the 17th of May. And the 17th of May is a crucial symbolic date in Zebal's work because his own birthday was the 18th of May, 1944. And he uses that, that date reoccurs throughout his work as a kind of a symbolic connection, which he, a hidden one to him that he puts in his work. People don't even know, of course, but the, the date 18th of May does recur, recur a few times. And then the 17th of May also recurs because it was the day, the date of the birthday of Ferber's mother who dies in the Holocaust, of course. And it's the day that Ferber leaves, the date that Ferber leaves Munich. So he would have arrived in the character, although we were not told that, but it's clear he would have arrived on the 18th of May, which in England, which is Zebald's birthday. So there's this, there's this kind of connection between them. So the 17th of May is a crucial, and also 17th of May is the date of, um, it was actually Peter Jordan's mother's birthday. It actually was. It was also the birthday of birth date of Susie Bechhofer, who was a main model for Austerlitz. So this date, 17th of May, although he didn't know that yet when he was writing his, um, his MA, of course, but that date is a crucial connection between him and the Jewish refugees that he's going to write about. And it's already there in his MA dissertation. This comes up often in his work, right? This coinciding of events. Yes. Just that seemingly randomly, but as you dig deeper, you start to say, what what was the importance of coincidence to him? Did he did he see it as some something deeper, like a synchronicity perhaps in a young sense? Or yes, exactly that. I think that's exactly what he 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 saw it as. I don't know whether Jungian, but in particular. Uh, but there is an expression, there is a, a you know, which I'm afraid I'm now not going to remember properly. It's is it uh, as our concrete or something like that. It's a, it's a French expression, and it goes back to the to the um, surrealists, I believe, uh, who also had a, a sense that that apparently random connections and and coincidences were actually secret clues and revelations to something. And I think that um, Zembal's obsession with coincidence, because he had it, he had it in his life as well. It wasn't just a fictional device. It was um, something that meant something personal to him. He he had a, his his belief or his intuition or his hope, perhaps, was that this world that we perceive and live in 
isn't the only and ultimate reality. There's another or others that lie behind, uh, and there are different times and different places in which the dead are still moving, as it were. That belongs to them. And his desire is that the their, their time and our time, their space and our space, should not be cut off from one another, but should be attainable. So we should be able to, you know, it's Austerlitz's dream. We should be able to make an appointment in the past as well as in the future. We should be able to go back behind the dark back of time, which is, of course, the, the phrase that, you know, Javier Marias took, <laughs> uh, and meet the people we've lost. And that uh, was, I think, a key, key sense and desire, of course. You know, I don't want to make out that he was a madman. <laughs> he wasn't a madman. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of metaphysical, he called it metaphysical, a metaphysical idea that we don't know the real truth about reality. And it could be like that. And he wants it to be like that. And um, that coincidences are signals, are places, they're kind of uh, tears in the fabric of our normal reality through which we can perhaps slip, you know, like through the wardrobe or <laughs> uh, something uh, as a magical place into uh, some connection with that, with those other worlds. And they're they're in, inexpressible. You cannot express what this, even the desire, you can't express. What, what is it that you want or believe? You certainly can't describe that other world. It's it, because the moment you use language, you're using our space and our time and our concepts. And that's you know, so there's no way it can be expressed. And I think that um, I relate this in my biography to um, the Chandos letter, the Lord Chandos letter by Hoffmannstadt, because there is a quotation from it. As you point out, as you've said, Zebal's work is absolute tissue of quotations from other writers. Hoffmannstadt was one. And of course, he must have admired and uh, loved his work. And um, in The Rings of Saturn, at the end of the chapter, uh, it's chapter seven, I think, where he goes to the hamburgers, you know, his friends, and he spends uh, time there. And then he, they call a taxi for him to go home. And they go outside and they stand by the Hölderlin pump, which is a, a genuine thing, which is actually there in, in the garden. Of, uh, of course, there's hamburgers now, no longer live there. Michael died some years ago. Uh, and his wife is still is still alive, but she lives elsewhere. The house is sold. But that pump was there. And it's the Hölderlin pump. Of course, Michael was a great translator of Hölderlin into English. And uh, they're standing there, and a light falls from the sitting room window onto this pump, onto the surface of the water. And across the surface of the water, there's this beetle that's rowing from one side to the other. And uh, the narrator in the Rings of Saturn says... This he sees this, and this shudder runs up or runs down his back, you know, right down to his heels. And I thought, what on earth is this? What is this? And then, it, of course, I realized that it had come from the Chandos letter. So I reread the Chandos letter. And in the Chandos letter, uh, the Lord Chandos, who can no longer use language, he's completely deprived of it, doesn't make any sense to him anymore. But what he has are these amazing experiences, which he can't put any words to. And one of them is seeing this beetle crossing the black water of a of a bucket actually and he this shudder his shudder he shudders it sends a shudder through him which he calls celestial and it's 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 um a sense of of identification with the whole of the universe he identi he, he feels himself flow into this beetle and he so he this is an experience of oneness with others you know, even just a beetle. <laughs> and I think that's what Zebald is, is, is evoking in quoting that bit when you get to that end of that very important chapter, which is actually the first chapter he wrote of when he, when he started the, the um, Rings of Saturn. That's the first chapter he wrote, um, even though it's chapter seven in the book. And so that shudder that runs down the narrator's back is not a shudder of horror or, or anything like that. You don't know what kind of a shudder it is. He doesn't tell you. It's Chandos's shudder. 
So it's just this amazing being struck by the your unity with the whole of reality, the whole of the world. Uh, uh, not sympathy, not pity, not anything like that, but identity. So it's the ultimate, you know, Zebald wants there to be an identity of times and spaces, and he also wants there to be an identity of identity, as it were. So he's, he's writing as extraordinarily metaphysical, philosophical, um, strangely uh, abstract, actually, which we sense, but we don't, you know, and, and that's one way in which it, that's one of the things that's behind it. Also, it's not entirely mad or anything. It makes sense on a literal level as well, because we do carry the past with us. We carry our own past with us, our own memories, but we carry the past of our culture quite often and our parents and our families and things that you maybe aren't aware consciously that, that happened to you. All these things are interwoven into some sort of a not uh, there's like there's like a collective unconscious almost in the Jungian sense these cultural memories that are hardwired into us, but also uh, on a personal level as well the the elements that went to make us up whether we're aware of them or not. So I can see in a sense how you could be excavating these things. Yeah, and you see in the rings of Saturn the the great um, image of it, of course, the rings, right? And we we get that right in the in the title. And we get it also throughout the book. This image recurs, you know, so there are those trees and I, they actually exist and I've seen them and they, they are, uh, they're in that part of Suffolk when he was working, walking through, I'm no doubt elsewhere as well, perhaps. And these trees, I don't even remember exactly what they are, but they, the, the branches, you know, uh, uh, descend to the ground, like as willows, for example. And they make a sort of circle where the, where the, where the, where the branches hit, touch the ground. There's a circle around the trunk. So, and he refers to that, he evokes that, he describes that. And, and then later on, when he gets lost on the, um, on the heath, you know, on Dunwich Heath, he discovers what's happening. He's going around in circles. He's going around in circles. He's not getting anywhere. And um, it's what it is, is he actually says, it's a cross section of his brain. So these are his thoughts that are going round and round. And there is a re repetition of circular thoughts in Zebal's work from the, a very early poem he wrote called The Eden Abend uh, Every Evening, right through to, to um, the book called Logis in einem Landhaus, which was translated as um, A Place in the Country, very well translated. And that's a beautiful book about his favorite authors, or some of them. Yeah. So there's Walser, of course, Robert Walser, and there's you know, Rousseau, and there's uh, Hebel, uh, Johann Peter Hebel, and um, various others. And um, it's beautiful, his, his great relationships of kind of easily expressed love are to uh, dead writers, basically, dead writers. And that's, of course, what Rings of Saturn is about, is dead writers. You know, we've got Conrad and we've got, um, uh, you know, Thomas Brown, of course. So these are his, these are his saving um, connections to, to the world. But as I say, so this, and in, in, in the place in the country, he talks a, a lot about how for writers, their thoughts go round and round in circles and they can't escape them. And that must have been an experience that he had. He also talked in that book um, uh, about how he was, he was sort of a magpie when it came to other writers. Like he, he said, um, I have always tried in my own works to mark my respect for those writers with whom I felt an affinity to raise my hat to them, so to speak, by borrowing an attractive image or a few expressions. Am I wrong in thinking he was accused of plagiarizing bits and pieces of these writers? But this is what everybody does. You, you pay homage to your influences in this same way by leaving little traces, particular word or image that somebody used uh, as kind of a sign of respect for those, those who came before you. Yes, I think that's what he felt he was doing. I think that's what he was doing. And as again, as in the case of the accusations of cultural appropriation, I agree with you that it's crude. It's, I mean, to say that just that doing that, tipping your hat and you know, using a phrase or a line, uh, echoing a phrase or a line is, is plagiarism. And no. <laughs> it, 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 and they all do it. Absolutely everyone does it. I mean, all great writers do it, I think. Uh, and uh, it, it is a tipping hat. It isn't plagiarism. I think it becomes, you know, partly it, it isn't because any everybody can know. I mean, Kafka scholars can pick out every single line, and there are millions of them, you know, throughout Zebal's work, 
which are taken from Kafka in one way or the other. I mean, uh, vertigo is a tissue of Kafka quotations from his works and from his diaries. That's fine because we can we know where they come from. We can find them, and they've got Kafka's name on them. I think where it does become it did become more difficult was in one particular case, which I describe in my biography and which has attracted some opprobrium to Zebald, which I'm sorry for, because again, I think it's a bit crude to just blame him for it and not think about what really is going on. But nonetheless, it is more disturbing. There are disturbing things about him. We've already discussed one, which is the photographs and the ambiguity of them. And in this case, he used, he, Peter Jordan, his Manchester landlord, showed him in 1966, when he first met him, some family memoirs that he had. Grandfather, was it, or his father? I've never known. His grandfather and, and his, his, uh, his uncle, and also one by his aunt, who had survived the um, Holocaust because she was living in Switzerland. And she'd written this, this memoir of her childhood in near Bad Kissingen in the 60s. And um, Peter Jordan showed this memoir to, to Zebald, and Zebald was blown away by it. He thought it was lovely. He remembered it. And then when he came to write uh, Max Ferber 20 years later, he asked Peter if he could see the memoirs again. Peter sent them to him. Well, to make a long story short, Max lifted lots of bits from this memoir by Peter Jordan's aunt, who was called Thea Gebhardt, for Louisa Landsberg's uh, journal in Max Ferber, which is one of the most beautiful things in that very beautiful story. Now, you know, I, I did a great study of this. A German scholar called Klaus, Klaus Gasseleder had done a very um, a detailed study of it before and published something, uh, a piece about it, a long piece, analysis of this. Uh, and our conclusions were very similar because, you know, it was pretty clear what he had taken. And he had taken some whole sentences. He'd taken um, certainly words. He'd taken characters, you know, uh, the description of that village, you know, the way that when you come around the corner, then you suddenly see the church spire. And it's absolutely straight from, from Theo Gebhardt. Now, he also, of course, changed everything. And, and Theo Gebhardt's um, memoir had some lovely things in it, but was not the great work of art, of course, that Sebald turned it into as uh, when it became Louisa Landsberg's journal. So he did transform it enormously, but he did use an awful lot. And, uh, you know, Thea Gebhardt was not Kafka. Nobody, she didn't publish anything. Nobody, she, her name was not on these lines anywhere. Like the wonderful image of the blue jay feather that this, and who is this tired child carrying blue jay's feather, you know, walking home. Now, Thea didn't write that, Max did, but the blue jay feather was in her memoir. So, I mean, was that legitimate? You know, was was it fair for him to have used her memoir when she was an unknown person and not credit her at all? And when I talked about all of this to Peter Jordan, who has sadly since died, he's no longer with us. But when I discussed it with him, the whole thing, he said, I'm very happy for Max, because he called him Max too, of course. I'm very happy for Max to have used my family story. I gave him all my family albums because all the photographs are of, you know, Peter Jordan's family. Uh, that was wonderful. I, I'm delighted to have my family story, my family tragedy preserved in a great work of art. But he said, the one thing that I do feel, I got him to say this after a while, he was not <laughs> keen to, but he did. The one thing I do feel is that he shouldn't have used my Aunt Taya's work without crediting it. So, that's a query. That's a question. I think my own sense is that he should have credited it. Where? Well, not at the beginning of the book, because that would have changed our reading, but maybe at the end. At the end and an afterward, he could have said, you know, these stories are absolutely authentic. They're based on real people's experiences. And in one case, on a, on a real memoir. And this memoir was by Thea Gebhardt, and I have used some parts of it. And she and her sister... Paula were real people, and Louisa Landsberg is exactly like Paula <laughs> Frank, she was called. I can understand his dilemma in that sense, because it, 
it, if you gave away the fact that this was based on a real person at the beginning of the book, then it undermines his method because you you find out well maybe the, is the rest not based on a real person? And even at the end, I could see if he if he put that in, he might feel that he was undermining his own um, mm. the image he was trying to create. But the sense that I got when I when I read this in in your biography was not that he was stealing somebody's stories, but that he took a very vivid memory from this person. And this part was perfect, but the rest of it didn't really capture what that person's experience may have been. So he, he used that, that kernel of um, firsthand memory to build a story around that you come away from just, just completely knocked flat. You know, he, you empathize with this person in a way that made it so vivid. So I, I see it, saw it as more of a, a testament to that person, that person's life than a, than a stealing of their memories in a sense. I agree with you. I agree with you. I think it was absolutely worth it. And it, it, it transformed all of these sources into the, this ultimately beautiful, moving work of art. And, and that's got to be worth it. On the other hand, there was that personal sense. I mean, because he was himself so ex- exercised by the moral problem of a German writer using Jewish refugees' experiences to create his own work of art and ultimately his own fame, of course, not that he was aiming at that, not that he even really wanted or enjoyed that because he genuinely didn't. His um, psychology we've been talking about of someone who found experience hard to cope with, he found attention hard to cope with, he found relationship people wanting to relate to him, you know, difficult. He, He actually did not enjoy his years of fame. But nonetheless, he was famous and hopefully will remain famous. I'm sure he will. He will be a great figure in in the canon of 20th century literature. Uh, So that is what he got from. And, uh, you know, he understood himself. He worried himself endlessly about the moral risk of of using Jewish stories like this. And I think um, it's it's a question. It's not an answerable question, perhaps. And I feel with you that it was ultimately more than more than worth it. You said in another place as well that you know he's he's been accused of being a German author ransacking Jewish stories and making them his own, but he he never wrote about the Holocaust or about the, the this type of suffering directly or the camps or anything like this. He wrote about um, the immigrants, the people who survived, and told their stories. That's quite a different thing, I think. It is a different thing. It is a different thing. I mean, he, he does, as we know, there is that very famous, I think it is actually 11 pages sentence, an 11 page sentence in Austerlitz uh, about uh, Theresienstadt, Theresien, the holding camp, concentration camp, not an extermination camp, as we know, but where people were held and from which they were then deported to the various extermination camps in, in the East. That, by the way, that all the material in that line comes from another book, which is by H.G. Adler, a very you know great work on 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 um, Theresienstadt. Adler was himself a survivor of Theresienstadt. Anyway, that is the one camp that he does describe, but he doesn't go into. There are no atrocities. There's no description of individuals. There is an account again, uh, going back to perhaps what I said at the beginning. There's an account of the language. The language are terribly important. The 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 dehumanizing, the absurd uh, language, uh, jargon that that the um, Nazis used in order to distance um, themselves, of course, from what they were actually doing, and uh, make it possible for these people to be treated in such an inhumane fashion. Uh, but so that's the only point at which he actually describes a concentration camp. But doesn't enter it and doesn't, um, you know, is not a, he never puts a character in a concentration camp. No, no, he, he doesn't write about the Holocaust. He's not a Holocaust writer in any sense. He is what well, I've called him. And I think James Wood calls him this, you know, the critic who's very interesting and important writer on, on Zebal. I think he says it as well. He's a post-Holocaust writer. So he writes about the consequences of the Holocaust on those who survived it. It's an in, entirely in a, a carefully discreet and delicate the way that he writes about these Jewish survivors, because again, he, he introduces, doesn't he, a, a distance. In other words, he's not dramatizing. He doesn't, you know, give you a kind of fictional account, uh, direct fictional account, you know, dramatic, uh, mimetic account of, of, of these people. No, 
he introduces the narrator who just simply reports what the real, what the sufferer suffered. And that's how, so it comes through a series of distances really like that. So he, he's very careful and delicate about that. And then I think he was actually in life as well, you see. So even though he used people's stories, that he did so uh, in, a, in a delicate way. One of the things I describe in my biography, which again has brought a good deal of opprobrium down on him, which I didn't intend and which I regret, but it's the truth and I'm a biographer and I can't, you know, this is not a whitewash. What would be the point of that? He um, was not always, I mean, that emotionally alive or to to some of his models. So first of all, this Teo Gebhardt story, perhaps, but then, of course, the most famous one or the most important one is his, his relationship to Susi Bechhofer, who was the, or a main model for Austerlitz. He read her book, which is called Rose's Child, and he um, saw a television program uh, about Susi, who was born in, in Munich, and she and her a twin sister Lotte were kinder transport children. They were they were in a, an orphanage because their mother could not support them, and um, you know orphanages were amongst the first the children to be you know put on to uh, kinder transports. So she, at the age of three, with her sister, was put on a kinder transport to England and came here and was adopted, taken by a um, family not. Uh, entirely unlike Austerlitz's family, her father. They, they, she grew up in Wales. Uh, her father was a kind of a, a, a preacher, a priest, and a, a vicar. And um, her sister Lot had developed a um, brain tumor when she was nine and died in her thirties. So she doesn't sort of. Part, you know, she's not in Susie's story, but Susie tells her story, and in her books, Rose's Child and and Zebug used some important moving uh, details from that story, um, primarily how she found out what her real name was, which happened when she had to do her O-levels, which are public examinations. And so her her headmistress of her school called her in and said, listen, you have to, you can't put your this name she was going under, you know, uh, on your, she was called uh, Grace man, I believe, you can't, but she doesn't say that in her book, but you can't put her your, your, that name uh, on your papers, because it's not your legal name. Your legal name is Zuzi Bechhofer, and you have to do that, otherwise you won't get, you know. And so this poor child is like, you know, she's like 16, or she's, and this is the first time. Well, it's not quite, it's, it's more complicated than that. They, they, they knew they'd come from Germany, but this was a tremendous shock to her, which she then completely repressed for the rest of her life. She does exactly what uh, Austerlitz does, of course, because Zebub based the story. So that central event in her life, he does use. And he doesn't use anything else. He, he doesn't, there's a lot he doesn't use. Private stuff that is in her book, he doesn't use. But he uses her kinder transport story. And um, she felt very strongly that her identity had been literally stolen from her. And she wrote an article to say this. And she wrote to Zebub about it. And he wrote back, and I've seen the correspondence. Her son, um, Frederick Stocken, has, has, holds these letters. And Zebal's responses to her are, you know, perfectly polite and nice. But you can tell he's not going to do what she wants him to do, which is acknowledge her the role of her book in his book. And then someone did tell me, although it's only one witness, but unfortunately you're not supposed to rely on just one witness, but since I only had one, I did. Uh, this witness, who is uh, uh, someone in Munich, who knew all about this whole story, and she went to a reading uh, that Zerbal did of Austerlitz in 2001, because it was published in early 2001 in German, because he died in December 2001. So there he was, he did his reading, and she went up to him afterwards. And um, I said, it said something about, you know, this about, uh, yes, I mean, I, I know the story of Susie Bechhofer and Susie is very upset about, you know, the use of, made of, your, of her story. And she said to me, he was um, quite undisturbed by this, rather indifferent. You know, he just said, oh, yes, oh, well, 
and then turn and talk to the next person or something, you know. So he didn't respond about this. He kind of just blocked it out, you know, which quite upset this lady. So, you know, I felt, yes, and I do describe this. I do describe that he wasn't, he tried not, again, it was part of his, he was self-protective. He, he just didn't want to engage with, with that. And he wanted, as you say, to retain the integrity of his work of art. He didn't want it to be in any way uh, destabilized or except in the way that he destabilized it himself. So, uh, you know, okay. He was a, an incredibly un, a uniquely empathetic writer on one side. And on the other side, he was a ruthless writer. He used what he wanted and could from wherever he could get it. And he didn't allow uh, human concerns to enter his artistic project. To be fair, I think all of us are guilty of this. You know, that's, I think Paul Theroux said this, that the writer is kind of like a shark, you know, just using everything, everything you say could be used, you know, in the right. So you really have to be careful what you say around somebody, if you know they're a writer, because. Absolutely. It's completely true. I mean, Paul Theroux, I can tell you a story about Paul Theroux. Please. Yeah. And that is that. Because, you know, my first subject was Jean Rees, mm. uh, the novelist, yeah. And um, her executor and great friend and then my patron was uh, Francis Wyndham. And Francis Wyndham told me, who was a great writer, good writer himself, he told me that he um, he went to a, a dinner one night. And this is, of course, decades ago. And who was sitting next to him was Paul Theroux. And um, uh, Jean Rees had just published a, a story called The Imperial Road, which is a very um, good short story uh, about Dominica, where she came from. And uh, Theroux had obviously read it. And so he spent the evening talking to um, Francis about the story and what was behind it and all the rest of it. And, you know, they had this conversation. And like two weeks later, uh, Theroux published, I have sadly, or not so sadly, in revenge, forgotten what, what the name of the story was that he published. It was absolute ripoff. It was everything that that he had learned from Francis about the Imperial Road. So, I mean, you know, he did it himself. Of course he did. I mean, people, you have to be very careful around a writer because they will just use the material that they find. Uh, and and Max was famous, you know, there was this, um, wasn't there, you can see it on the internet, they're called um, Maxims, W.G. Zabel's Maxims, which of course is a, is a pun. And the, it was they were put together by a couple of his uh, students in his um, last creative writing class at the University of East Anglia. And uh, the a lot of the other students, you know, remembered things he'd said and so on. And these two guys uh, put together a load of, a list of things that Zabel had said in his because they were literally in his last class, you know, they, they, the last class they had with him was five days before he died. And in one of those maxims, well, the most famous one is basically steal whatever you can. He said to his students, he said, if you, you know, have an interesting conversation or you read something interesting in a book and you're struck by it, put it in your notebook. Don't put where you got it from. And two years later, you'll forget. You'll have no idea where it came from and you could just use it. I've seen this happen too. Yes, uh, there was a, uh, it, it was something, one of the early columns I wrote for a Toronto paper, uh, it was a travel column and I said, it was something about the Mediterranean and I used the image like a, a breath would cloud this water of glass or something like this. Uh, I got it from um, Wallace Stevens, I think, but then I found it in Lawrence Sterl and I thought, Jesus, he stole the same one. <laughs> so, but writers know this. I mean, have you, have you read um, Coast, Coasting by Jonathan Rabin? Yes. Yes. Long and there's that famous ago. scene where he, en he encounters Paul Theroux, who's also writing a book about, uh, in his case, walking around Britain and right. they meet and have lunch. And, and the description of the event in, in each of their books is completely different. But yeah. but Raven, you know, Theroux gets on his boat and they're having having something to eat. And, and Raven said, so you finding anything? No, no, nothing interesting. You? No. <laughs> they're just completely <laughs> guarded. But the, the, way they, the way they present the event is quite different. So they're, yeah. they're well aware of, uh, yeah, not not saying anything, but to be, to be, I, I mean, I understand the ethical problems and I sympathize with that, of course, but to be charitable to, to Zabald as well in this, in this event, like he's in writing about refugees. I mean, he's also an immigrant and you know, he, he did nothing to put himself into this situation. He was a little kid when the war happened. He's a survivor of this as well, but from the other side. So a uh, son of a soldier, like, how do you deal with this? Your father was a Nazi. 
he has a sense of survivor's guilt about the whole thing, but as would somebody who survived the camps and why did I live and somebody else didn't, you know? So it's, it's like, he's, he understands survivor's guilt from his side. And it's, I get a sense that he's plunging into these stories in order to uh, more deeply empathize with the people who shared these horrible events, but from, from the other side of it and to try to, you know, explore that and share their stories and preserve them. That's, that's the sense I had from this sort of ruthless borrowing. I think you're absolutely right. I think you're, there's, there are no two people who are closer than the son of the you know, second generation German and, and the children of survivors. Um, they, you know, it, it reminds me of uh, a dear friend I had who was uh, um, in the British Army when, you know, in the Normandy landings and um, had some, you know, took part in some terrible battle with a, an SS uh, unit you know, uh, in which most of them died, but he, he survived. And then decades and decades later, uh, he wanted to write his memoirs and he went to, you know, and, and he, so he went to his regimental uh, records and so on and got what he could. And then he, of course, realized that the SS unit also had records. The Germans were terrific record keepers, naturally. And he discovered that um, the, the general uh, in charge of that um, brigade or unit was still alive. He got in touch with him. And those two men, formed the most intense relationship. You know, they, they were the own, but you know, one of the few survivors, one from one side, one from the other side, of that battle, which was so devastating, of that whole devastating war. And even though, you know, they were on the different sides, they had more in common with each other than with anybody else on the surface of the earth. And when uh, my dear friend Tony then died uh, some years ago now, the general was the German, the SS general, was devastated, absolutely devastated at the death of, of Tony because it was his closest companion, really. So, yes, I think that um, certainly Zebald was exploring his own feelings, his own indeed guilts and, and survival guilts and so on in, in the stories of the, of the Jewish refugees and certainly filled them with his own feelings of despair. I mean, that is one of the stories that I tell in, in my biography that Peter Jordan told me that uh, Max had been talking to him, you know, in the 1980s when he was writing the story uh, and had actually said to him, Peter, do you ever, have you ever had thoughts of suicide? Have you ever? And Peter said, no, well, no, I haven't. And he said to me and his wife, Dorothy, laughed and, you know, said it was true that Zebold was deeply disappointed. He thought he should have, you know, wanted to kill himself because of his terrible, you know, loss of his parents and so on. And, you know, he was really disappointed when, when, when Peter said, no, he'd not. And Peter laughed about this, too, and said, uh, of course, you know, the person who really wanted to kill himself was Max. So those feelings, yeah, the, the, those feelings, who, who did have the feelings that, that he gives to Max Ferber and to Dr. Henry Selwyn, who, uh, you know, was a completely different character from what he describes anyway. Um, well, it was himself. These were his feelings that he was exploring. And again, I think that's what most writers do, of course. Those are the things they know best and have to express. Those are the stories they have to tell us. Uh, of course, it was also true. Uh, Susie Bechhofer said uh, she never actually forgave Zebald for, as she saw it, stealing her story. But um, she did say to me, that he understood the feelings of refugees like her better than anyone else. He truly understood. Yeah, he struck me as a very liminal person. Like he, he's caught between two countries. You know, he moved to Britain at quite a young age, had an uneasy relationship with Germany. He's caught between two languages, German and English. He's, he's almost caught between two times as well because he's so much back in, the, in these traumatic events that he's trying to uh, write about and understand. What, so what was his relationship with... Um, with Germany, like he, he went back there on several occasions on academic postings and things like this, but he always seemed to get out of there very quickly. Like it's, he couldn't, he didn't fit anymore. Yeah. Well, I think in the cliche term, it, it was a love hate relationship. You know, I think people in his um, hometown of Zonthofen in Bavaria, up in the Alps, you know, near Austria, felt that he, Dislike, you know, the, he, the, the description of Zonthofen, the account of Zonthofen, which is in Paul Bereiter, is pretty damning. It's very damning. You know, they, Lucy Landau, the character who's telling the narrator Paul's story, 
says, you know, it's a, it's a miserable hole. <laughs> Uh, and you know, describes all the inhabitants as uh, Nazis, basically, or as having gone along with everything very eagerly. And so, so people in Sonthofen do feel, I think, mostly. I shouldn't speak for them, but that's my sense that they, uh, from speaking to people, uh, that they feel that it was almost entirely hate. But that's not true. Of course, that's not true at all. It was love hate. I think he kept trying to go back. That's what people don't know until I wrote it into my until I discovered it and put it in my biography, he, he tried to go back about, at least seriously tried, at least three or four times. So he applied to the Goethe Institute twice, once when he was at Manchester, and then once later when he was at, at um, UEA, University of East Anglia. Uh, and indeed, on the second occasion, he went through the whole training um, program, you know, and then only decided to quit and go back to UEA um, when he was in his... Um, Posting, basically, or first posting, uh, still in Germany, not abroad. So uh, he, he that were those two occasions, and then he also tried. He also applied. He got his habilitation when he was quite old, you know, late forties, I think, something like that. I forgot now exactly, but he got his habilitation and he applied to several German universities and Swiss universities without success. So he did try and go back. He always wanted to go back. On the other hand, he would always say. You know, I'm, I'm, I feel very homesick and I want to go home and I get on the train and just as it's coming around the corner, you know, entering, going to, coming into Kempton, which was the local railway station, um, you know, and I'm excited and everything. And then I step off the train and I immediately want to go away. I, I can't stand it, you know. And it was partly, of course, personal. It was his own family situation, his own, um, but his family situation was largely that of a second generation German. His problem with his parents was at least partly, you know, that they had gone through the, the Third Reich with, um, without objecting, really. Uh, I mean, they weren't fanatical Nazis in any way. His father never joined the party. His father was actually uh, a member of the, uh, the SPD, which is pretty unusual for a, an army officer. So he was not a not a Nazi, and it wouldn't be fair to say that. I mean, Zebo treated his father when he was young, when he was a teenager, like a Nazi. But he would never have said his father was a Nazi, and we shouldn't say that. But his father was, you know, he he said to me in the in the interview that we did about this, he said um, that his parents would always say to him, well, they wouldn't talk about it. That was the problem. But the furthest that they ever went was to say that they were internal, you know, dissenters. And he said to them, he said to me, I said to them, there is no difference between internal dissent and internal collaboration. There's no difference. You know? And he was very harsh about his parents in, in that way, very, you know, uh, unforgiving. So, you know, that was, that was a burden that he carried. It was a tremendous burden that he carried. And whenever he went home, he, and he, of course, I suppose what, he was a deeply attached to the landscape which is beautiful, which is remarkable. I mean, the beautiful alpine landscape, you know. And uh, I understood this terribly well because uh, my parents had a similar, similar thing, or my mother did, certainly, that she, as a child, had always gone to this very beautiful um, alpine village as on holiday, you know, and her summer holidays for years, and was very attached to this place. And after the war, we finally, you know, my parents survived. They escaped from Austria, came to England, then emigrated to Canada. And from about the time that I was 10-ish or so, we went back on summer holidays. And we went there. We went there to that place. My mother was so attached to it that she wouldn't, didn't, she, you know, why it was taken from me once. And why should I let them do that to me? This is, you know, my place too, and I'm going back there. So... I understood this kind of attachment, but painful and conflicted, as it were, attachment. So they'd come from Vienna, and my mother would never, was never wanted to go back to Vienna. That was, you know, we, we went back to Vienna for various reasons, but she was never happy there. So I understood this, this kind of conflict between, you know, was there, after all, my mother left when she was 18, Zebald left when he was 22. This was their, just think of it, was your home? Uh, for that time, it was your language, it was all your friends, it was your, it was your life. And that's what's been taken from you, uh, if you're lucky to survive with your life, of course. So, uh, you know, that was his dilemma. It was a dilemma. It was, again, it was an ambivalence and an ambiguity. There's nothing that's 
black and white and clear in Zebel. It's always nuanced, you know. It's, it's really interesting how that early landscape kind of shapes how you orient yourself in the world. You know, it leaves, a, it leaves quite a deep imprint, whether you're, whether you're aware of it or not. Mine would be the St. Lawrence River, I think. You know, I came from a small town along the St. Lawrence. The river was always in the background of everything. And even directions were oriented by the river. So I never really understood. You know, north, south, east, and west didn't make much sense. East and west sort of did. But uh, it's always, uh, you know, towards the river, away from the river. And it's... It, it came to define my sense of river as well. It's such an enormous, as you know, it's such an enormous river. And I, I would see rivers in other places and think, what is this? This is, you know, toss a stone across that. But that I don't, I don't know that I could go back and, and live in this kind of small town again. It's, it's be very difficult, but yeah, but that landscape it does leave a defining stamp that haunts you, I think, in a, in a sense for, for the rest of the time. What will, what would that be for you? What's your defining landscape? Well, as it would be in a kind of way, I don't think I have one. You know, I'm even more deracinated than than Zebald was because, uh, I mean, I was born in London, uh, the end of the war. I'm the same age as he was. Uh, and then when I was about four, four and a half, my parents emigrated to Canada. So I grew up in Montreal. I had a very good childhood, very good time, happy time. I have no complaints, you know. But it wasn't, um, it wasn't a... You know, it wasn't a beloved landscape to me. I always missed, I always felt I came from somewhere else. And I suppose my my deepest connection in Canada was, in my growing up time, was to uh, the, the countryside, to a farm. I always went, we went uh, for other holidays, the holidays that we didn't go to Austria. <laughs> we went to a farm in Quebec. And uh, that was my very happy, happiest place. And ever, throughout, throughout the rest of my life, I have, in fact, I have noticed, always tended to live, as I do now, in villages and not in cities. And I think probably that comes from that farm, you see. So perhaps if there is anywhere that has that meaning to me, it's probably the farm in Huntingdon, Quebec. I know this area, yeah. Yeah. But um, curiously, as I say, I think Zebald, because he, you know, he lived till he was 22 in that of course, first in the village and then in the town. So there was a change. But nonetheless, he lived in that alpine landscape, which is what held him. You know, I don't have an equivalent like that. So do, do you think this is what attracted you in part to his work, this sense of rootlessness recognized in, in him and in yourself? Yes, I, I'm sure that's true. I think, um, you know, the way that I came to him was in a sense because I, you know, had written a biography of Primo Levi. So I had deeply explored um, late in my life. It's something that I had avoided rather like, you know, Austerlitz. I had not read about the Holocaust or even tried not to think about it um, until I was about 50. And then somebody sent me uh, The Drowned and the Saved to review. And I just realized that this was the greatest writer I had come across in mm. a long And I just, so I fell in love with Primo Levi. And I then uh, decided it was time in my life that I had to do this. And so I, I did. So I read everything and uh, and wrote that biography. And then when I finished my biography of Primo Levi, I really thought, well, well, there's nowhere to go after Primo Levi. You know what? And of course, by then I had already um, read Zebald and I had met him and so on. I never thought I would write a biography of him because we were the same age. And I never imagined him dying. Uh, and, of course, people have to be dead, you know, before you can write about them really properly because, you know, there needs to be a whole story, really. Anyway, um, you know, he that didn't then die, and I didn't think about it for some time because it was too horrifying. But then after a while, after a year or two, two years, 2003, I think, I suddenly thought, well, of course, there is only one place to go after Primo Levi. And that is W.G. Zebel, because as you just said yourself, he is the same thing from the other side, from the other side. And I thought, uh, I need to, to explore that. So uh, that's how I really came to him, uh, rather than any sense of identification with him or, or uh, similarities or, you know, connections in that kind of way. Although, as you've pointed out, they do exist, and no doubt these things do happen, do function or have an influence, you know, it's like unconsciously. Um, I think I certainly identified with Primo Levi, even though he was a man and he was Italian 
uh, and all the rest of it. But I completely identified with him as a writer and as a person, I think, not at all with Jean Rees, who is my first subject and whom I love and am fascinated by still today. She's a great writer, and uh, I was very lucky to be able to write about her when I did. But to me, she is the most, the least like me, despite the fact she's the only woman. <laughs> she's the least, one I have the most sort of external fascination for, you know, whom I feel, this is the most extraordinary person whom I don't understand at all. It's nothing to do with me. And I must find out about her. So how was um, writing about Sebald different as a biographer compared to the previous two? Well, I suppose in a way, despite everything I've just said to you, that he was closer to me than any of the others, you know, because, because he came from that part of the world, you know, Zonthofen is literally, I mean, Oberstdorf, which is where he went to school, which is a town, you know, a few miles away, 10 or 12 or something miles away up the mountain, uh, is literally on the border with Austria. And when I went for walks around there, uh, I would have, you know, I'd have my phone with me and my phone would be saying, welcome to Austria. And then I'd take five steps and it would say, welcome to Germany. And it would keep doing that, you see. So it's literally on the border with Germany and Austria. And to me, there was, I just, it, I recognized it. I recognized it. It was like the food was similar. The landscape was very similar. The language is different. Uh, Algorish is not at all uh, like uh, the dialect that I had heard in my mother's Austrian village. Um, but it was terribly, terribly, it, it struck a chord struck a chord the whole place struck a chord and um so there was that kind of sense of coming home and also it's my parents language you see being able to 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 work in german my german isn't isn't terribly good because i learned it as a child it's very natural you know it seems like a natural language to me but i make terrible mistakes because i never studied it <laughs> so i never know whether something's die or das so i make case mistakes and gender mistakes you know um, but people are incredibly kind and nice, and they just always say, you know, well, we, we know what you mean. It doesn't matter. So, so um, yeah, I, I should have taken off a year to study German grammar before I did this. But never mind. It's a natural language, and I just speak it, you know, badly, but naturally. So, and read it similarly. So, um, you know, coming back to my parents' language was was a great um, homecoming in a kind of complicated love hates a Baldian sort of way. And that was not true of, of my other two subjects, of course. Italy was a wonderful, wonderful gain for my in my life. But it was a gain, a pure gain. I, I never, you know, apart from being a tourist, I had nothing to do with Italian culture. I knew nothing about it. So yeah, I suppose I was closest to Zebal of all three in those in that way, in those ways. And that meant that I had to be, I, I decided that I had very consciously decided that I had to be careful not to be too close to him, you know, to, to, to uh, be detached. And I, I think I have been, I mean, I tried to be uh, my love for him and warmth for him and his work is just natural. I can't do anything about that. And I hope that's important too. Uh, but I did have, I did try to be detached and I actually had in mind Wonderful Janet Malcolm, you know, uh, who's one of my heroines. I think she's a great writer. And she's incredibly detached and acidic and, and you know, even aggressive about her, her subjects. You know, I can never do that. And don't particularly, I didn't want to do that. But I did remind myself of how detached Janet Malcolm always managed to be and tried to sort of just keep that in mind, not imitate it, but just realize that I needed some detachment. And that is one of the reasons why I, you know, uh, very consciously and willingly, uh, you know, put in all the things about Zebal's character that weren't just lovely and delightful. And, and so, as I say, to some, some people have got quite upset about his, his lies or his fictionalizing and his treatment of Zuzi Becher and so on. And I, I'm sorry that they take this line, but, but you know, I felt it was important to tell these truths, and I did. Well, you, you have to really. I mean, you, you don't get interested in writing about somebody unless you, you find them a compelling person and, and in some sense likable. You, you don't write a book about somebody you despise, but um, I suppose you could, but nobody would want to read that rant. 
well, some people have done it, or some poor biographers have had that happen to them, you know, that they start by being interested and then they end up actually really hating the person. I, I think this happened to a biographer of um, Anthony Burgess, I remember reading about once. Yeah, that he ended up really, really hating him. No, he's a very, very interesting writer, you know. So I don't know, but he was quite a difficult person. I don't know why this biographer biographer ended up ended up disliking him, but it's it's uh, you know I certainly did not end up disliking Zebov. Well, that, that's a risk about uh, meeting any of your kind of heroes or great influences, right? You you can quite often come away very disillusioned because you find out they're just normal people with a lot of. I know, but it's so weird to have an expectation that they're not, you know. And and I found um, Zebal uh, really as compelling. I mean, I only met him, you know, to talk to in depth twice. I encountered him on other occasions, but those weren't, you know, they were just social occasions. I interviewed him twice. So we had long, you know, serious conversations and so on. And um, I found him absolutely as compelling in life as, as on the page. First of all, he had the most wonderful voice. Anybody who's ever knew, known him, you know, will say that to you. And you can hear it when, if you listen to, for example, on the internet, you know, there's a, the speech, the talk he gave at um, the 92nd Street Y about a reading from, from Austerlitz in 2001, shortly before he died. And you can hear his voice there. But it's not the same when it's recorded, of course. He had the most wonderful voice, very deep, rich voice. And he um, uh, he rolled his R's in a particular way that they do in in, in the algo, you know, uh, which which was very very uh, touching and funny, really. And uh, he was funny. He was extremely funny, uh, entertaining, um, uh, and of course, as I say, extremely extremely gloomy. And um, very just very. I just believed everything he said, which of course was wrong. <laughs> I shouldn't have, <laughs> but he took me in entirely. So for somebody who's never read Sebald's work, where would you recommend uh, where would you recommend they begin? Well, I would recommend they begin with the emigrants because um first of all, it was the first book that we all read in English, you know, so as English readers, you were repeating as it were the experience of his first readers in English and perhaps then get some sense why there was such a such a overwhelmed experience, you know, or response. Uh, and second of all, uh, you know, because it's short, there are four stories in there, and they the, the first one, Dr. Henry Selman, is very short, and then they each get a little bit longer, so that the last one, Max Ferber, is quite a long story, but it's still just a lot like a novella, you know. So mm. if you have any form of difficulty and or not not falling in love with it, you can stop after one story, you know what I mean? And also, finally, because um, for me probably the single most beautiful and perfect thing he ever wrote or that I've ever read, it's slightly different, is Dr. Henry Selwyn, the first story in, in The Emigrants, which is absolutely so, it's, it's vintage, it's, it's intense, Zewald, you know. Uh, the narrator is constantly making these comments, which um, remarks and observations, which are deeply mysterious and strange and but intriguing, you know, you, you just need to go on and what's going on here. And, and here's Dr. Henry Selwyn. He comes across him. He's lying on the ground looking at the blades of grass. And, uh, and you, you, find, you find yourself in this very, very strange universe, like, unlike anybody else's. Uh, and it's constantly quite disturbing. You know, there's this beautiful house, but the windows are blind and you can't see in or out, it seems. And, and uh, you know, it's it's got the strange staircase that's hidden in the wall where the where the servants used to go up and down. You see, it's deliberately, deliberately hidden from view of the lords and ladies who didn't want to know the you know the real processes that have supported their lives. So there's all sorts of echoes and and reverberations and meanings that you 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 surrounded by. And then of course, um, Dr. Henry Selwyn, uh, who is this English gentleman. Uh, eventually, suddenly, real, or you know, after only a short period, because of course it's a short story, uh, reveals that he is not an English gentleman; that he is a Jewish refugee. He hardly, you know, ever communicates or ever touches anybody. But he, at the end of telling the the um, narrators the story, he holds out his hand. You see, for the first time ever, and they 
shake hands. And then at the end of the story, Dr. Henry Selwyn, uh, the narrator, learns, has killed himself with his r- r- hunting rifle, which he never used. And there's, and there's a very, very beautiful ending. I mean, the endings of all the stories in The Emigrants, every single ending has it just as a piece of writing. It's exquisite. Yeah. So that's why I would recommend The Emigrants. Yeah, yeah, those are my favorites as well, I think, if I had to choose one. The, the story of Ambrose I was quite taken with. It's just, yeah, incredibly told. That and I think for for um, people who like travel literature, which is quite a lot of the readers of this podcast, uh, The Rings yeah. of Saturn would probably come closest to that. Although it's much, yeah. much more than um, a journey along, you know, the coast of England. It's... Oh, much more. But it is that as well, as you say, and the description. Mm-hmm. Of... That's the first one I encountered. Is it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's, it is many English people's favorite one for, for obvious reasons, I guess, because it's very English, you know. And it is, it's exquisite, that one as well. I mean, they all are. They all are, I think. And not to speak, of course, of, of um, Austerlitz, which is probably in the end perhaps his greatest masterpiece. It, my favorite is The Emigrants, but that's personal. You know, that's personal. Austerlitz is probably the deepest exploration. It's, after all, it is the exploration of the same thing that he's exploring in The Emigrants, this late emergence of that trauma. That's, that's what he's looking at. The trauma, this particular trauma, of the Second World War. There are many traumas throughout history. His view of history is that it's just a series of traumas. Um, I must say I agree, <laughs> but this particular trauma is the one which he explores because it's the one he's born into, and um, uh, that probably Austerlitz is the deepest exploration of it. It's rehearsed particularly by, well, I was going to say particularly by Ferber, but no, by all of them, by all of them, all the characters of the emigrants are, are you know, refugees who have repressed the truth of their histories from themselves. And, and from everyone else, and are trying not to, you know, to try not to face, not to remember, and then it's the story of what happens when they remember, really, which is devastating. But at the same time, self-saving. And and when you say that, you know, you picked out Ambrose Adelbart as, you know, I think you're right about that too, because the thing that the things that he writes about Adelbart are just summaries, really. So when he says things like. Adelwald's retrieval of memories, when he, he tells towards the end of his life, he tells um, Feeney, the narrator's aunt, he tells Feeney uh, for the first time some of his, you know, his life, his memories, you see. And she says, or perhaps the narrator says, that doing this, he was both saving and destroying himself. And that's, that is perhaps a summary of all of Zebel's writing. It's saving himself and you, the reader, and the subjects, but it's also destroying them because of the horror of it. But that's the perfect note to, to end on, I think. Very well said. Well, thank you very much for your time, Carol. That was fantastic. Such an interesting writer. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. I really enjoyed that. That was really interesting. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Personal Landscapes. If you like the podcast, please give it a rating on iTunes and subscribe through your favorite app. You can find links to today's podcast and more conversations on Books About Place at ryanmurdoch.com. You'll also find a donate button if you'd like to contribute to the costs of the show. All donations are greatly appreciated.